they spent the next 30 years working at jobs they hated. Um, and I remember making a huge connection then to f to be trapped in employment is a terrible thing. Firm of figures knows your money cuts down on strife. Time to trust your future. Firm of figures love your life. The Firmer Figures Business Show is brought to you by Financial Gym Studios. Welcome to the only gym where someone else does the working out for you. Where you get impartial tips and strategies in plain English to help you understand your money, love your business, and trust your future. Introducing your host, author, speaker, and creator of Firmer Figures, the cantankerous coach, Georgette Roland Osborne. Is this you? You've been in business for years, but your personal situation is just not improving. No matter how much you earn or you take home, you cannot seem to accumulate enough cash to reduce your financial stress. Well, introducing the How to Build a Buffer of Personal Money and Stay Out of Debt checklist. It's a quick start system that will help you reduce debt, increase savings, protect your future and enjoy yourself today without monthly boring budgeting. What you get is a one-page checklist that shows you the steps that you need to take to change your situation forever. And if you get the checklist, you also get access to a free mini course that takes you a little deeper. And it's, this is for you. If you are in debt, you're just covering expenses, maybe you're ticking along. Or you're getting used to having more money coming in than you are normally accustomed to. And you can do this system even if your earnings stay the same each month or fluctuate. Isn't it time you paid yourself first? Go get your checklist and mini course at financialgymforbusiness.com forward slash P-B-C. That's P for Papa, B for Bravo, C. See you there. Today's guest is a learning and skills specialist, debt advisor and financial success coach. She spent 12 years helping people understand how their money mindset determines their financial success. Her fascination with financial success was sparked when as a child, her father's business collapsed. Her work as a debt advisor led her to discover the four money mindsets, which I'm looking forward to her telling us a whole lot more about during the show. And in her years of experience, what she discovered was that whichever of these you have will determine your level of financial success. Building a successful business with her husband, Joe, resulted in, in them becoming financially free in 2012 and contributed largely or hugely to her understanding of how to develop a rich money mindset. They run personal and business money mind shift workshops and individual coaching, which transforms clients finances and her book the four money mindsets which is how i came across her is a number one amazon uk money book it is with great pleasure i introduce karen sutton joel now did i say that correctly yes you did indeed oh okay yeah. okay i mean to say what's up that's what's, 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 a bit of a oh, hard lovely. name thank you ever so much <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to dive into business and money in a moment but before a little icebreaker because i want myself obviously and my or my, my listener to get to know you a bit better so i have a few little icebreakers silly questions Fantastic. just to find out a little bit more about yeah. what makes you tick and so first one is without sending you into therapy if you had a nickname growing up what was it and why were you called that goodness if i could think of that a nickname growing up and i would think i was conscientious quite a conscientious person if there would be something around there. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, okay. Mm. You see, the yeah. others are nice one. I won't tell you ones I was called. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have a famous person that you've got a secret crush on? Or maybe not, maybe not so secret? Do you know, I don't know. Although I do have very quirky taste in the sort of people I would kind of fancy <laughs> that. I do think, do you know who I always thought was really a bit special with you know what's his name gene wilder he's probably really for your time but it's just people who are a bit quirky and unusual quirky. i think i'm drawn to karen he's yeah. not a bit quirky yeah he's well he's quirky. A lot quirky. Yeah, yeah. yeah 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 okay and if you're a car what are you, what are you an executive saloon a sports car or a four by four 
I think it will be a four by four. I do like the outdoors. Why is it? And it's the women. For always the four by four. How that's weird. Right. Just, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Not as feminine as we could be make out. Don't think so. <laughs> think so. And dead or alive, what two people would you most like to meet if you've ever thought about it? Mm, I think I would like to meet Emmeline Pankhurst. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And probably Florence Nightingale. Okay. Florence Nightingale, because I live in the Peak District and I live within oh, a stone's throw of the house she lived in here in the Peak District. And my little girl goes to the school she founded. Oh, okay. So oh, I would like to, yeah. Well, oh, all right. And do they sort of have rituals or special they occasions? Do, they do, they do, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. And last but not least, not including Richard Branson, who in the business space right now do you most admire or admire? I do think I admire Daniel Priestley. Okay. I really do. Yeah. yeah. And he's um, close to home as well. And so. he's close <laughs> to home as well in KPR. Yeah. But I, I just, I love this whole thing of anybody, but particularly him, who, who they have a passion, they have a dream, and they just go for it. Mm-hmm. And I just love that. D- Daniel is a special animal. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't <laughs> it the truth? He does. He yeah. just he just cuts through. Yeah. Just, yeah. And, and, and in, in fact, because he was he and Darren Sherlock. Yeah. But then were the first people that really opened my eyes to what the possibilities were other than grafting yeah. every day for yeah. a living. I mean, I'd heard it before, but they made it. Yeah. Tangible. Wow. So yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah. With you there, I can I can see that one. Yeah. So we're almost a bit like a, um, should we say um, two sisters from another mother? Did because the yeah, because my we're very similar space that I come from a, a, a more of a linear angle where you're a bit more um, holistic yeah. as well as um, you use a, 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 the opposite word, shall I say? That you're not quite, but I know, I know you're more on the mindset side, yeah. which I do a little bit of, yeah. but I'm more on the practical. And I'm fascinated by what you do. And also, I didn't see the connection, strangely enough, because I never saw myself working for myself. But also, my father, my father didn't lose his business. He he died. Yes. Not leaving the business in any great shape. Goodness. Thinking that he was always going to be around. Yeah. And it's fascinating how when you do the Steve Job thing, you join the dots. Yeah. And you go back and you see how where you are today yeah. is a definite path to what happens to you, particularly as a child. So tell us a little bit about that story and, and what the impact was on you. Well, I think it, and it, it, it hit, I mean, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. What happens to you and particularly, I think, around your relationship with money begins in your formative years and the background was my dad came from one of the wealthiest families in Ireland and my mum from a very, very poor background. And from my real youth, I just remember my mum. It wasn't that she was some nasty gold digger or anything like that, that she really believed that the only way somebody like her could get some money was really to marry somebody who, who had lots of money and they would give it to her. Mm. And my father's family were Oh, Georgette, were they disapproving of the marriage? It was incredible. And in a fit of pique, my dad went off and he set up his own business after a row with my grandfather. And like an awful lot of fledgling businesses, after three or four years, my dad's business failed. Now, I was absolutely, I suppose, completely paralysed with fear. I was the eldest child there were a number of us and it's same same to you and i think that position as well you take on an awful lot of what's going around you from your folks don't you and the anguish and all of that sort of thing and i just remember and i must have been about 5 at the time the two things that i remember really really i remember understanding there was more money going out than was coming in and i also got hold of a ledger and I was very young, but I was able to understand that there was more money going out than coming in. I was petrified. And I remember sitting there and I was really scared. And then later, it was later that day, we had no money. My mom took me around in the car and she was trying to sell little packets of hair accessories 
to various pharmacy shops and places like that, because that's the sort of outlets that sold those things long ago Mm -hmm. to no avail. And she was she was sitting in the car crying and we were penniless and I was terrified. And I remember I didn't realize my emotional connection with money was being set at that minute. But I vowed somewhere deep down I would never be sitting in a car with my terrified child penniless, that I would always have enough money. And you know what? I think that's where some of the conscientiousness comes from. Some all of that. (laughs) I always did. Mm -hmm. It's true, actually, because when you say that, I remember saying the same thing. It was um, a a boyfriend or actually it's my current husband. I remember when we met the first time and he says, why are you so driven? Yeah. And I didn't go into the great, the, 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 you know, the whole story. But I remember saying, as long as I live, I will not be that woman That's right. that my mother was. Yeah. It's a very similar thing. I will, ironically, I did become her for a while. Yeah. I remember thinking the very thing I spent most of my life saying I wouldn't be. You became. Is exactly what I became. I the thing. You can't outrun. You have to turn and face. Yeah things yeah. and hearing you speak I just thought how how weird yeah. was somewhere in Ireland yeah. somewhere that's in London right. <laughs> that's absolutely right yeah. so fast forward you're an adult now so yeah how how much of that was truth because you say it, it happened to you when did when did that manifest itself or how did it manifest itself in adulthood? how it manifested itself then as time went on um I was always driven and driven. It was funny when you said that word. For me, that is how anybody would describe me is driven. And I was always driven to it was to have control for myself of my own money, of my own life. And I always wanted freedom. Fast forward in life then what my father got a job in the family business that he hated he loathed it, Georgia, with every fibre of his being. And my mother retrained as a teacher and went back to work and she loathed it and they spent the next 30 years working at jobs they hated Mm -hmm. um and i remember making a huge connection then to to be trapped in employment is a terrible thing and i think that hugely drove me to think there must be a way around this employment thing because this doesn't look good at all Um, (laughs) And and it was that thing. And I thought, right. there. And I, I kept on and I used to work through the whole time. I was obsessed with like business models in my mind. And I would go around looking at all sorts of things. I'd be like 16, 17, 18, looking at houses. OK, how could you how could you make money out of that? Look at something there. How could you make money out of that? And just playing with business models. Um, and I was always very, very good and conscientious with money and in terms of managing money and saving money and making, you know, all of that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I sort of understood that actually you could have power over your money. It didn't have to have power over you. And of course, after my dad's business collapsed, we had to go to live with my granny and my auntie who had two kids. She was separated from her husband and we all lived. And there was my siblings and myself and my mother. So we were all squished into this tiny house. There were five of us to a bedroom. I remember. Wow like fighting my cousin for a piece of meat and all of that. And we were like, it was really, really extreme poverty. And it taught me so much that actually you, people can survive amazing things. And it probably takes some of the fear away from it as well. If you've been there. Yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, 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 you've yeah. Been there. Yeah. My mother always says, God never gives you more than you can bear. I'm not so sure always. <laughs> But it did comfort. It yeah. was very. It's a very comforting, yeah. very comforting thought. Yeah. You know, we're like, yeah, really, I need to bear this. <laughs> Truly, okay. So, what? How did you? Did you ever go into employment in any shape I or form did. before you worked for yourself? I did, and this is this is heartbreaking in a way. What I did, I started off in in Ireland, and I went to university because I believed. You had to go to university the way everyone from where I came from went to university really was probably a total waste of time for me. I don't know. But after it, I I'm so keen to set up my own and I set up a chimney sweeping business. And these were in the days because I'm probably a bit younger than I look in the days when they had coal fires and all of that. And it was just fantastic. You would go around two houses 
doing the chimney sweeping, I branched out into window cleaning. I had ladders. I had a lad working for me and all of that. And it was just, I think what I enjoyed was the buzz of selling because people would get such a shock at this girl turning up in the doorstep. Yeah. Face. And I had endless business. And this was the time the recession in Ireland was so extreme. You could have a PhD. You wouldn't get a job sweeping a floor. Mm. And I always had plenty of money because, of course, I had consistent income out running this little business. But my mum couldn't bear it. She couldn't bear that I was doing something, I suppose, to what she thought was so degrading at doing something like that. And I was loving every bit of it. Anyway, <laughs> do you know what I did? And this is this is awful. I sold out. I moved to London. I got a proper job and I married an investment banker. I, oh, that I, could work. I spent, <laughs> that could work. <laughs> do you know? And I totally, totally lived this employment. I climbed the corporate ladder, all the rest of it. Um, and but I always, do you know the way in my soul and my heart, I knew I was doing the wrong thing. I but I did you. know that for me to leave and get out of the corporate world and all of that, I I would terrify my parents. I would terrify everyone around me. They were so scared at that point my own immediate family, because I'd had such a good job. I had a huge house in London. I had all of these things. And at 40, I just thought, I went, I just left, left my husband, left London, Stop it. went for it, um, moved <laughs> up to the Midlands and set up businesses up in the Midlands. And um, what were they? And uh, the, the business we set up, um, the man I'm married to now, myself, Joe and myself, we set up a property business, but we're not property investors. This is a, a rental property business where we house vulnerable people and we provide housing for them and we make a very nice income from it. But it is absolutely, you know, the way when I hear of people with property businesses and some people have fantastic property businesses. They're not always like ours in that if you buy property in London, and of course, when I lived in London, I'd bought plenty of property in London. It doesn't take a genius to sit back and watch the market improve and, and improve the price of your property. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It just goes mm -hmm. up in value. Whereas where we were up in the East Midlands, actually, in the last 12 years, if you factored inflation into account, property prices have declined by about yeah. 25, 26 percent. But we've still made a fantastic cash flow consistently because we've come into this business and we've looked around the area we were in and thought, right, there is there is always profit to be made regardless of the circumstances around you. Always. You just mm -hmm. have to follow the money. You have to look at what's there. Now, in Derby, there are a caucus of people who are poor and disenfranchised and who were almost socially excluded and they find it very hard to access really good housing. So we have some blocks of flats and we house specifically um, men over about 45, 50 years of age. Okay. Um, who have maybe alcohol problems, um, extra users, all of that sort of thing. And we've really, really made a fantastic go of it. It's a, like a, a property business to me, a rental property business, which is mm -hmm. providing homes for people. It's a real people business. So how, so how does the in income come? Is it the, the tenants uh, or is the it? The rental, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, of course, the the rent is quite good on these sort of properties and the returns and of course if you absolutely understand what matters to your customer you will always mm -hmm. make plenty of money but one of the things that we learned as we went on in developing this business is that all customers I feel want to feel valued mm -hmm. and my customers really want to feel valued and it's so important that Joe and I go down and we talk to them and that do you know what I mean? And that, that mm, we interact mm. and that when we set up blocks of these flats, we are conscious of, of we need to create community mm. because people who are in these sort of situations in their lives, they need other people around them. They need each other. 
Mm. Do, do you know Anne all of that? Mm, mm, mm. Funny, I, I interviewed a lady. She's an American scientist. She's famous for talking about stress in life. Yeah. And one of the few people that, that talk about it where it's in plain English. Yeah. Though she's a scientist. And she said the number one cause of stress in the world is being disenfranchised, i.e. breakdown of relationships, whatever they yeah. may be, yeah. and feeling isolated. Yeah. And men are far more affected by it than women, than women are. Yeah. And men over a certain age, yeah. it's phenomenal. Yeah. And right there, she said, if you solve that problem, yeah. a lot of the issues in the world yeah. – would simultaneously be solved yeah. because it starts with the individual and a feeling of either isolation or lack of resources, of lack of connection and all those things. That's, and it's 100 percent right. It really, really is, Georgette. And the, our customers and we've seen people who they really things have improved for them over the years because yeah, yeah. if they feel a little bit of and it was the thing about feeling valued. That mm-hmm. if they say, look, can we change this? Or because this matters to me, that that's important. Because mm-hmm. because of, and and so many, I would say practically everybody who ends up with us, they've been through family breakdown. They have mm-hmm. all of the things that you've mentioned. Those are all of the things. Then people get into alcohol, drug abuse. People, of course, I used to be a debt advisor. Um, they get into debt, and there's just this spiral of circumstances, and then suddenly people end up where. It's almost like nobody else wants to know them. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, that they yeah, end up yeah, on our doorstep. And the thing is, they're the best tenants. I would not want to know the business model, I don't think. Uh, do you know, yeah. it's, I've never come across, I've heard of niching down, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is proper. You know, yeah. and, and also being very different. Yeah. Yeah, that's um because I deal with a lot of people who deal with properties, but it is yeah. very much the, the standard standard model. Yeah, the, you know the who is in there other than it may be families or students or someone doesn't even yeah come into play. Yeah, not at that level anyway. Oh no, great. Yeah. So so you were doing that, and you were also a debt advisor that's at the same right. time. That's okay. right. Um, and it was very very interesting because I was doing that, and we also were running a building company so we were doing um maintenance largely for other landlords um and that gave me huge insights into the mental you know other landlords and what they were thinking i think this was as well how we got so good in our own property business because if you're in in and out of other people who were you know your peers properties Day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, you, you learn and you talk to, we'd sit with the tenants and say, so what is it you value? What is it that you like? We absolutely had a profile of who mm-hmm. we can serve. You know what I mean? And they would mm-hmm. be drawn to us. And then I think motivated by what happened to me as a kid with debt, I thought I want to do a bit more. And I trained as a debt advisor and I got a job with a company as, as a debt advisor working um, sort of freelance with them. But anyway, so used to go out, I would advertise and get a call from somebody who was in a situation with debt and go out and I would assess their finances and what was happening. And then we would look at, okay, is there anything can be done? And if it could be done, we would then get people to negotiate with the banks and the various people to whom they owed money. Mm-hmm. And that will all be sorted out. And this was, you know, I really, really enjoyed that work. I think because when I went to people's properties and I would visit them at home, most of the time, Georgette, they were, you would go in and I could feel the energy. These people were in such a terrible place. And I knew from a kid, I knew exactly what that place was. So I really believed I was helping them. And then it started after a while to dawn on me that, there was an element of this was becoming a bit repetitive. They were getting back into debt all the time. And there was a moment when things shifted for me, when I was called out to a house in the centre of Derby. And there was an old lady and an old man in the house. And the man was 75 and his wife was 76. And I came into their little sitting room and there were both floods of tears crying. And they were in an awful way. And the bank had lent them £12,000 and this was 
it's probably about five years ago now, six years ago. Um, and I thought, oh, my word. Then when I started to delve a little bit deeper into their finances, they couldn't pay this back at all. And the bank was hounding these poor little old people. Their property was on one of these equity release schemes. Oh, then I looked yeah. at something else. There was a problem there. There was a problem here. There's a problem here. So I thought, yes, we can actually help you. So I had somebody negotiate with the bank on their behalf and all of that. And we got it sorted. And they were so grateful. A few weeks later, I went on. I went to help their daughter and their son and their cousin and another cousin. And <laughs> you know now how slow I am. I'm thinking I should be seeing this pattern here, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, off she went to yeah, helping them. Six months later, the man phoned me up and he said, look, Karen, I've got myself into a spot of debt again. Could you help me out? <laughs> I, I didn't know what to say, you know. So I, I didn't know I was actually and I, I, I think my first thing, I was kind of a bit angry. And then I was probably I was just in a state of shock and I couldn't believe it. And then when I sat down and thought about it, I thought, Do you know what? This is much more about you, Karen, than it is about this, this poor old guy. This guy is managing his money in the only way he knows how. Right, this is yeah. a mindset. And mm -hmm. I'm an NLP master practitioner. And I thought, right, I'm going to model some of this stuff. And also my training, like by trade, when I was in the corporate world, I was a learning and development specialist. My master's degree was in competencies. And that's all mm -hmm. about, you, you know, what are the actual skills that make somebody good at something like average at something and what are the skills that make somebody brilliant at anything so mm -hmm. like I would go in and analyze capabilities around what's the difference between an average and a top end lawyer in a specific topic okay. or what's mm -hmm. the difference between an average and a top end auditor and or, and all of these different professions um and I was a head of a learning and development department. And we had a lot of different roles in the big organization I worked for. And when I started to think about it with this guy, I thought, this is a mindset. But you know what? These things are just skills. There must be somebody who's averagely financially successful and somebody who's top end financially successful. They, they, they must be just a set of skills and a set. Of, and the mindset is always underneath skills. So the okay. difference, if you take we'll say like a customer services personnel. The skills between an average customer service person and a top end customer service person on the surface of it look the same. Do you know what I mean? Greet customers, mm -hmm. do this, do that. Mm -hmm. But the mindset underneath that's driving them, which is like the, the attitudes and the behaviours and the beliefs and the values and all of this deep down is quite different. And when you go to recruit those two different people, you look, you look at you know, the sort of things that a top end person, the kind of attitudes and beliefs and mm -hmm. values and thoughts and feelings are different. And I started to think, oh, my God, there's something like this going on around money. I'm <laughs> going to really, really mm -hmm. investigate this because there is something going on about being in debt and not being in debt. And I hadn't really worked out there were four money mindsets at that time. I'd only worked out. There is an in-debt mindset. This is why this guy is doing this. This is why the family <laughs> is doing it. So I started to map out what are the things you see um, and, and looking at the accounts of somebody who's got an in-debt money mindset. And as I asked more and more questions and I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people and I used techniques that I used for competency analysis to look to dig around exactly what are the things here we're seeing that's making somebody run an in-debt mindset mm -hmm. or the other ones and I discovered actually there are four money mindsets there's one to be in debt there's one to break even there's one to be comfortable and there's one to be rich and they're totally different totally different totally different and oh. when you pick up somebody like I can look at somebody's bank balances I can actually talk to somebody about money for 10 minutes and I could tell their mindset easily, very easily. Do you, do you know what? That's a scary thing. I had an accountant say that once. And I remember, like you say, we, when I look at people's accounts, they tell a story. Yeah. And I remember sitting down with accountants or auditor and, and, and we're both sitting there going, he's depressed, isn't he? And he went, yeah. Yeah. And all we were doing were looking at figures. Yeah. And going through the paperwork. And, so, and as we said, I remember thinking, what? I knew it was true. Yeah. But it, that was the first time I ever equated the 
practical side of the money to the to the person. Yeah. Yeah. And that changed my whole conversations when I'd have reviews with people, the conversation. You've got to pick your words sometimes, but there is thing when I say things that people know about themselves, people things that people know that they won't admit and things that they just don't realise are going on. That's right. And the second two would cement the relationship. So when people say, well, I can't afford to do this, can't afford to, and I'd say, look, you're always overdrawn. Even though I'm not saying overdrawn, these people are overdrawn, like, you know, in six figures, yeah, yeah, <laughs> stupid yeah, money. Yeah. But, but they're still overdrawn, <laughs> you know, and they'd say, and I'd say, so I'm waiting for the, the, the conversation. Well, you know, we're going to have to review where they go. No, 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 we can't let you go. And I'm thinking, I don't do anything that anybody else in my profession does. But then I realize it's the conversations that go on. Yeah. That is very different and you're not scared to have them because I am I'm not blunt, but I, yeah. I don't shy away from the elephant in the room. Yeah. I say, so why are you doing that then? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> doesn't always work, work out well, but yeah, but it's important. <laughs> but no, yeah. So, so tell us, take us a little deeper into the into the four sort of obviously not going into too much depth. I want people to read your book, but. You know, some idea as to if you're in the debt mindset, what the characteristics, if you're in the break even, you know, just sort of a, at a level so we can under, identify the differences and maybe do a little recce on ourselves. And I think that's, that's the thing, you know, people being able to just look at where they are because there's no problem being where you are for anybody. Mm. It's the choosing to do something about it. What was fascinating about it is if you can see from somebody's accounts their money mindset. Um, very, very quickly. And there is a definite pattern to what they do with their money. So as I was off out investigating this and asking questions and interviewing people, I asked a number of questions. And it's in my book, a detailed number of specific questions to find out. But one of the most interesting and um, the first question I asked is, so, so how do you get your money? And what do you do with your money once you get it? And what you find is that if as soon as the money hits somebody's account, what happens with it really, really shows somebody's mindset. So because people often think, oh, mindset, this airy fairy thing. No, it's not. Mindset is the deep beliefs, values, thoughts and feelings that lead you to make decisions that take actions that give results. And the mm. results show up in your bank balance, basically. Mm. I use almost exactly that phrase the other day in an article. Yeah. And yeah, it, 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 yeah. it is. Because I always thought I'm not woo woo yeah. at all. And it's not woo woo. Yeah. But listening to stuff that you talk about and I was really, really, really cemented. Yeah. How I speak to to other to my clients and so on. So yeah, that's right. So go into a little bit more yeah. specification so that we can you know so, so we can have an understanding. So for the in debt mindset, somebody who's running an in debt mindset, the first thing you will see is that some of their money, the minute the money comes in, some of that money goes to service debt, consumer debt, be it a car or a credit card or whatever it is. So you will see a pattern, which is spent or borrow some of the money is gone they will mm -hmm. then give to friend family whatever they have to do and then they will spend the rest so it's spent or borrow give mm -hmm. and spend yeah mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. it now if you look at the pattern of somebody with a break-even money mindset what you will see there is this is the money mindset that is driven to cover their fixed costs first. So they will cover their rent or whatever it is and the bills and then they'll give what they ever they give and then they'll spend the rest and they'll try to save a little bit at the end. But actually, that always goes. So when you say give, what do you mean give as in? And they will like give to their relatives charity. or give to charity or okay. anything like oh, that. Sure, but sure. Everyone gives money. But mm -hmm. the first thing you will see is that they spend, but that they cover their fixed expenses and they don't get into debt. Now, my granny had that kind of money mindset and lots of more elderly people when I've yeah. come into contact with them have that where they feel, you know, they will have three jars and that they'll have the bills money in that jar and they would have the household expenses in that like food and stuff for the kids and this sort of thing in there and then 
anything left over would be for upcoming things like school uniforms or whatever. And they have this principle then, but once the jar is empty, it's empty. Mm-hmm. And you wait until the next period comes around and the jars are replenished. And they often use phrases like neither a borrower nor a lender be. Do you know? And the mindset is exactly what it does on the tin. It says exactly what it does on the tin, which is the break even. The money Mm -hmm. comes in, they will spend, they will cover some expenses. And then they will try to save a little bit at the end. And often if people with the break even money mindset do save, they save with something specific in mind. So mm. for a, I don't know, a holiday or a wedding or a whatever, but they but new bathroom. That's right. They say with something specific in mind. Now, the comfortable money mindset is different. What you see with that is as soon as the money comes in. It's saved. There is a portion saved and it's very often automated. So these mm. people will save, then they will give and but then they will spend the rest. But they're first. The, 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 absolutely. The first thing they do is they save. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's very different, the sort of patterns between mm-hmm. the three. Mm-hmm. And the rich money mindset is 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 very different then because what you see there is the first thing they will do when the money comes in is they will leverage it. So they leverage right. money, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then they will give and then they will spend. Mm-hmm. And it's... And it's... it's is, is the mindset dependent on the fin- their financial resources? So... <laughs> If if you, you know, I mean, for more for the benefit of um, I'm trying to ask the questions that people ask Would me, you? but your perspective is very interesting if people grasp it. So if if they are two people both earning two thousand pounds a month, yes. Could they still be different or would someone start off as the comfortable now up to four thousand and suddenly become the wealth mindset. Oh, wow. Thank you for that question, mate. That is a brilliant question. Not at all. What you actually see happening is it, none of the mindsets have anything to do with the amount of money you have. Thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. And probably one of the first things when I teach people about money and run workshops is to say that it's like what whether you will be wealthy or not in the future or poor, has all to do with what you do with you, the money you have today, completely today. Mm-hmm. The decisions you make today are all about what your future will be like. And if somebody has 2,000 or 200 or 4,000 or whatever, and they're inclined to get in debt, so borrow more than they earn, or they're inclined to save, or they're inclined to just break even or leverage. It just doesn't matter how much they have. Okay. Yeah. And can leverage be purely income generating? I don't know, like, you know, doing passive income, wealth building, or could leverage be the way they create their income? And you see, it it, it can be both. And what you characteristically see with people in terms of, of leveraging money when it comes in is that... Yes, they will use it to they use their money to build assets. I mean, that old phrase income follows assets. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the sort of things they're spending their money in, it's very different to the other mindset. So they could be purchasing something that's for their business. To create wealth in the future, to add value, Um, or they could be using some of that to as collateral to borrow a bit more money to do something that will generate more money for them. They might be borrowing um, margin for for stocks. Do you know what I mean? Or anything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. They might be trading options. So it's all different sorts of things they will be doing. But the, what, what they are using that money for is they're seeing it as a tool for something that will be able to get them more money in the future. In the future. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. Okay, and and how it's not an easy thing. I mean, I call myself a serial, I say serial debtor. I've only really had one big bad debt when the business went. Yeah. But if you see what I mean, yeah. but it was so devastating to me that, as far as I'm concerned, it's never it's never gone away. But I am. How should I explain it? I'm a I'm a, a giver. Yes. A carer. Yeah. A rescuer. Oh wow! Yes, yes. So that's yeah. that's my downfall. It's not earning money yeah. or where to put money. Yeah. It's 
I've got ten pounds and you're in a bad way. I'll give it well, to I can you. always make another ten. Yeah. Have the eight. Yeah. And then I leave myself with two. That's right. And then so I've now got to go and really hustle to make the that that's my mentality. I don't do it anymore. Yeah. But I default to because oh well their need is greater than mine that's and, nice. and 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 it yeah. and so that's that's my mindset. But it's been very helpful in the business world because I spot it in other people. That's right. Um, so easily in women. And so, I, and that's where I decided to really push my efforts with, with women Fantastic. because that put yourself last. We're always last. Yeah. And I was told once, you're so good when it deals, comes to dealing in the business world and in your private life, you're crap. <laughs> and I couldn't argue. But it's so, so it, I couldn't argue. It's yeah. so oh, true. So, so that journey, mine was more climbing up a, a, a mountain. It was no, if I had, fa- if I had somebody like you at that time, my, it, I don't know where my path would have been. It, it didn't exist or I didn't know where to look. With you as that person meeting someone like me or or with similar, yeah. well, in many respects, worse traits, to be honest with you, because I was like, because of my drivenness, I was able to sort yeah. that out. Yeah. Other people say to me, well, I owe a whole lot more than you did. How come I've lost my home and you didn't? What did you, what did you do? Yeah. So what did, what would you do? Someone coming to you and they're in, let's say they're in the break even. Yes. And they want to move to, to the, to the wealth mindset how hard is that to do and do you know, where could they start is anybody can do it anybody can and i say things like it's simple but it's not easy yeah because it takes an awful lot of gumption for you to pull yourself back and do what you did that takes gumption that's somebody who has a lot about them who can go from one mindset to another because you've learned your mindset from or, you know, family, people around you, significant mm. people and all of that. And to wake up one morning and somebody think, do you know what? I'm going to be very different. Takes takes an awful lot. And I've seen some amazing people do some amazing shifts in their mindset. Mm. Um, the, the methodology I use, though, is, again, this is looking at not just the sort of the soft end of it, although there is the soft underlying end of it as well, is looking at the key skills because there are, bunch of key skills around money that we are not taught in schools at best we are taught a little bit about managing money and a bit about managing credit card debt (laughs) not even that yeah (laughs) and as i delved very very deeply into because i've been obsessed with understanding what makes somebody really good with money and what doesn't Mm. absolutely completely driven by it Mm. um and i've pulled out bunches of skills and sub skills and what I do is I actually audit the person the part the person's accounts and everything they're doing and when they're talking to me about their behaviors with money and I audit it in terms of skills so it's exactly the same way as if you went for a job interview as a whatever a, a lawyer and they're checking you out as to how competent you are I audit mm-hmm. it like that and very often you find that Somebody who has a break-even money mindset or an in-debt money mindset or a comfortable money mindset, because that's a very dangerous money mindset, comfortable money mindset, um, in terms of where people end up financially. Um, it's that they're lacking bunches of skills that they've never even heard of. Mm-hmm. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So Yeah, completely. And, and Com- I, completely. And I'm, You're I, speaking to me, yeah. completely. Uh, but, yeah. And it's not anyone's fault. I mean, what really, really... I can think this is this is mad now, but it my little one who Maeve, she's 10 and she goes to the local school founded by Florence Nightingale. And I love that school. But what they teach them about money is a sin and a crime. And long term, I want to do something about this. She came home. Be a bit more forthright, Karen. I don't know what you mean. Be a bit more forceful. (laughs) Yes, do you know? Say what you mean, woman. Yes, dear. You're Irish. I've never known (laughs) an Irish person to to be so passive. So she came home and she says to me, her teacher's name is Johnny Rowland, right? She says to me, Mommy, Johnny Rowland has a break even money mindset. Oh, wow. No way. She's nine. when she said this. I said, tell me about it. Oh, my God. Go on. So anyway, she went on to tell me. I thought, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. She said, and it's Enterprise Week. This is horrendous. It's Enterprise Week. And we've been given this exercise. And I've gone to Johnny Rollat and I've said that whoever designed this exercise doesn't understand money. And it was designed by somebody with a break even money mindset. 
But what it was, when we deconstructed the exercise when they came back, and this was set nationally, Georgette, for all our kids in state schools mm. throughout the UK on the same week, they were doing an exercise that was in the name of Enterprise Week to teach our kids how to be entrepreneurs. And what it actually taught them is you have to have money to make money. And the kids all gave up. Yeah. Because the yeah. person who designed it was probably sitting in the Department of Education somewhere and they had never fed their family from running a business ever. They'd been an mm. employee. Mm. 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 Do you know, yeah. but it's no one's fault. If you are going to school and you are taught an employee mindset, which is completely different mm. to having a money mindset that can generate and create your own money. It's, it's funny what I found as well. In fact, I um, I created it. It's like a, an infographic and it splits the percentages because when I try to speak to people about doing one thing more than the other. Yeah. OK, if, if yes, there is an argument for leveraging. Um, but then if you really deep in debt, you've, you've got to n know what your got percent. Yeah. Percentages, I suppose, is, is a yeah. way to what proportions you yeah. can do. You can't suddenly yeah. leverage every penny you have no. and never pay your credit card bill and so on. But even when I kept saying it in concept. It, I just wasn't getting anywhere because people yeah. were like, well, I yeah. don't know what you mean. Yeah. So the, the the breakthrough was when I put percentages to it. Yeah. And then people could see it. So I'd say, well, if you put that much towards your necessities, that much towards. Yeah. And that, that was the building block. And then once they got that bit, they were like, you know what? If I got rid of that and just concentrated on that. Yeah. So instead of doing 5% on wealth building or investing, Actually, if I got rid of my debt, I could put thirty five percent on, and then time. And I didn't even go oh. into timings because that was just gonna that was just gonna blow the brain. You know what oh, I mean? Oh yeah, we were just gone then. Yeah, yeah, just gone. <laughs> so then it yeah. was like, well, now you can do that. Yeah. What about if you did that before? So instead of like paying your necessities, why don't you say to yourself, I am not paying any more than this percentage on bills. Good woman. That's it. Yeah. So this has to go. So basically, because with most business people, you pay everything and you pay it out. And then this is what's left. Can I now go and buy that bit of machinery? Yeah. But if you say to yourself, no, that's it. The, I'm not going over this. It takes time to do because you have to yeah. start negotiating yeah. with suppliers. Yeah. And can I afford that member of staff? And what people do is they just cut costs. And it's not about cutting costs. It's about strategically cutting back on things on. that aren't feeding the business and yeah. so on. But that's a whole different conversation again. But I had to start with the just do these percentages yeah and then people were like fine i can do that and then once you do that you can then because they start to see a, a, awesome. a quick result and they could see how it works because okay. that was my thing i couldn't see how i came across um daniel and darren Scholler was because i knew yeah i needed to i wasn't into doing um property um stocks and shares yes yes yeah i got a thing for that and, yeah. and you know as i got older and i realized i get dividends for doing bugger all yeah, like, nice nice. Yeah. Um, but it, I fell into that and yeah. I, I'm not a stocks and shares expert I just have some very nice yeah. that's all it was but I thought in the world in the world of work I hadn't heard the phrase income follows assets all I kept saying to myself was how do I create intellectual property I didn't, didn't even know what that meant but I just knew that the people I'd studied all had some form of IP that and assets that they were leveraging and I did a search and it, never mind schools Karen I searched on Google I've knew I looked up people who I thought would know and like and the results that kept coming back was just rubbish and it, it was I knew it wasn't the case yeah. you know write a book and that's intellectual property and you can you don't get richer for books unless you're Stephen King and then out of the blue like like a phoenix rising from the ashes there was a little video of Darren Sherlock doing the story of the two women who he'd gone to help them sell their business and if you've ever heard it and they wanted to sell it for, I can't remember making it up, a million pounds or something. Yeah. And he said, give me a year and I'll show you how to create assets and we can sell it for 20 million. Yeah. And I was like mesmerized by this story. Yeah. Like, it's you I need. It's you. That's what it is. But he didn't say what he did. Yeah. But that's what I needed to learn. And then so the, the, the discovery was what is that bit he does in the middle that creates that thing? Now, for some people, it is property investment. For some people, it's stocks and shares. For others, it's businesses. Yeah. What is that thing? But I didn't know. I just knew that there was a thing. Yeah. I didn't know what they were other than property. Yeah. And and how do I do it? So Brilliant. that's why it became business. But there was no, and I don't really remember 
why I came up with that idea. I would be like, because I totally come from, my father ran his own business. Yeah. So I don't come from an employee mentality, but I was surrounded by people with the employee mentality who reinforced the fact he had his own business. Look what happened to him. That's right. That's exactly right. Look what happened to him. Yeah. So you'd be crazy. And for years I was headhunted for businesses trying to get me to come and work with them. You'd be the front person yeah. and we'll do all the stuff in be- behind the scenes. And I was like, no, I'm just going to get yeah. a job. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So the education isn't even so much about just the money. It's just that it's possible, Karen. That's right. It's just that you can. Yeah. That if you just start there, it's possible. You may not be Branson, but you can be a whole lot more than where you're at Isn't now. The truth? And if yeah. you just got that message yeah. across. Yeah. For no other, for, if we did nothing else, what difference would it make to the, yeah. especially the young people out there coming up? They're a little bit more enlightened than we were, but there's still a lot of young people out that there who are still to. not in that. Yeah. That's so right. no, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, let's say we waxing lyrical. Karen, I could talk to you forever because <laughs> you, you're you right, right, you're right up my alley. You really yeah. are. You really are. And we'd have to have you back. <laughs> do a therapy session, get someone to actually do a, and find out more about in depth and where your business is, is now, but how things are coming along. Now you've got yeah. the book out and you're doing the workshops as well. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the workshops as well. So people want to know more about them. Yeah. Well, we, um, we run two different types of workshops and they're, personal money mind shift because very often for somebody it's just that they know it's going wrong there's something not working and on on a personal level we'll have a look at their 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 money their accounts and that and 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 they can shift that or for some people it's it's a business and it's shifting into understanding how do you manage and run your money and what the five skills that you need to be good at the different money skills throughout that business so we run those two separate workshops and we do some one-to-one coaching as well mm-hmm. yeah okay um, and they find that where would they find find that on your site or yeah, is, is it that you do every, yeah. you do them regularly or do yeah. you sort of do them we're um, we're going to be organizing um and this is probably something um that kind of always subscribe thing we're, we're going to be probably planning some in the future but we're not running them at the moment I'm going to do them after it. What I normally do, and this is the, the joy of being a bit more financially free, I take the whole of summer off. So I won't be starting work again until really the 6th of Yeah, all right. You're all right, Karen. It's all right. Yeah. So it's funny enough, my, my emails went out this week saying, because I don't go on holiday, I say we're closed. I actually shut. Do you? You're closed. Fantastic, yeah. So if I say holiday, that means things are still happening. You'll still want stuff done. Oh, yeah, but closed, actually, I think I might do that. <laughs> that is fantastic because where I'm at with things is I've had, the book has come out on Kindle and that's fantastic. And the hard copy is coming out. Okay. And that's when I want to pick things up again and run with them. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm taking some time out now. That's great. Okay. Well, I'll put the links to your site. That's right. Yeah. So on yeah. in the show notes and so on. But no, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. No matter how much you live and breathe a subject, there's always more to learn. So thank you so much for taking the time. It's it's been really great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks no a million. Worries. And what about you? Are you facing any issues in your business? Any financial or productivity issues? You are more than welcome to contact me and see if we can get you sorted out. Email me at feedback at firmafigures.com. For the links to any of the resources I've mentioned, go over to financialgymforbusiness.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find them in the show notes. If this was useful to you, please would you consider going over to iTunes if you're an Apple user or Stitcher if you're an Android user and give me a rate and review. I love bringing information to you and would really love to know if this is helping. Every five-star rating that I get not only tells me that I'm not just talking to myself, it also tells iTunes and Stitcher. That way, when people are searching for a show like mine, I'll show up. Full step-by-step instructions on how to do this can be found at my site, financialgymforbusiness.com slash podcast. And if you have a website, blog, podcast or business that you want mentioned, leave the details and I'll give you a shout out. And if you don't want to have to remember when I'm on next, just click the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening in on so that you get notified. In fact, if you haven't done it already, why not do it now? Thank you so much for being here. Bye bye.
Davis knows your money cuts down on strife. Time to trust your future. Firmer figures love your life.